The United States, measured by land area, is the third largest nation in the world. With its large size and geographic variety, it includes most climate types. And it's one of 17 mega diverse countries, a term referring to the group of nations that harbor the majority of Earth's species. But while being blessed with such natural abundance, we've designed our economy around an ethic of materialism, thus resulting in cheaper labor producing most of our goods far away from us. Perhaps this works for some of our everyday items. But does this model really make sense for the food we eat? And are we even aware of just how disconnected we've become? I mean, think about this number. We import over 94% of our seafood. Similar number of our shrimp are imported. Of the 2.2 and growing billion pounds imported every year, the FDA inspects less than 1%. There's a non-zero chance that what you're eating has some sort of pesticide or antibiotic or hormone or, or other banned substance. We should have the right to know exactly what's in our food. This is my good friend, Steve. He's built an urban shrimp farm in Downey, California. A little over a year ago, we were standing in an abandoned auto parts shop. Today, we tell a story. It's one of perseverance, positive change, and a way to do business that is quite literally fresh and forward thinking. This is a story about doing things better. And as with most good stories, it's probably best we start at the beginning. I mean, we're guessing that the world wants what we want at the same time that we want it. And if we're wrong, you know, we won't be shooting video here in a year. But ultimately... Cut that out. You see you, Ray. Welcome right. back to the farm. Third time's a charm, right? Yeah. Actually, four times. So what are we going to do today? So we're going to do a tour of the updated farm with all the systems and... I mean, it's a fully functioning farm now, right? Yeah, you're gonna like it. It's a lot different than uh, last time you were here. How was that, two, year, two years ago was the first time we did the video? Uh, it could have been more than a year and a half. A year and a half ago, this was a junkyard. The facility is located in Downey, California, a city about 12 miles southeast of downtown Los Angeles. Before Steve got here, it was an abandoned auto parts shop. And before that, well, the history gets a little more colorful. The first aircraft factory to install a powered mechanized assembly line. The Bull Tea Plant, Downey, California. Steve's decision to put a shrimp farm smack dab in the middle of LA County was partly motivated by the fact that it's a bit of a foodie destination with revered chefs and top rated restaurants within a stone's throw. The other part of it was to bring awareness to the fact that a farm can successfully be implanted in a densely populated urban area and used as a platform to educate. What's crazy is that even in a state like California, with 840 miles of coastline, we import 90% of our shrimp. And most simply aren't aware of just how problematic the shrimping industry has become, both in terms of the environmental impact and its effects on human health. More on that later. Well, in 2020, we were standing in a junkyard. And now heading into 2022, it's a fully functioning shrimp farm capable of producing 1,500 pounds of fresh shrimp per week. Well, the first time you were here, we just had one tank and we kind of use that tank to show people that you can grow shrimp indoors in Downey. Um, and then, you know, kind of raise more money, continued through the permitting process and then got everything built and permitted. And um, really we've been fully running our second system, which we're excited to show you uh, by like September. I think we turned it on in September. So we're just harvesting our first batch from our, from our clear water system. And that's a system that we feel is really gonna change the game for shrimp farming. Yeah, so this is the nursery area. These are separate systems, and this is where they come in around 17 days old, and they spend the next month of their lives in one of these two tanks. So we can hold about 100,000 shrimp in each tank. We grow them to about one gram in four weeks, and then they go on into the grow out system. We make sure we give them um, a little bit higher protein content feeds, uh, we make sure they're tested for bacteria and viral pathogens that could be problematic. So we kind of use this as a nursery and a quarantine at the same time. Yeah, so this is our clear water system and, and these are all the production tanks and we'll work our way down towards the filtration. So, so there's two technologies that are commonly used in shrimp farming and we use both here. Uh, I, sh I should say modern shrimp farming. Prior to that, there was no real technology. It was kind of flooding areas and then figuring it out. Uh, this system on the right was built to grow them when they're younger. And that sort of simulates the mangrove environment they're in when they're younger in the wild. 
So a few important details were talked about off camera, and I'd be remiss not to mention them here. One is that Steve spent some time in Thailand prior to Transparency building out a shrimp farm and has intimate knowledge of the local practices. One thing Steve shared with me was just how critical of a resource mangroves are. They serve as a key habitat and essentially a nursery for small shrimp, fish, and other sea life. And we've lost over half of the world's mangroves over the past 40 to 45 years. It's estimated that half of that loss is due to fish and shrimp farming. Certainly makes you think, hmm, what if there was a better way? Okay, back to the tour. Um, it's lower technology, lower capital to get it running, but also has some limitations because you don't control as much in that system. And the water is that kind of brownish murky color. Um, totally healthy, totally good product, but we wanted to take it to the next level and go to the clear water technology. So this is the grow out area. So this is where the shrimp come after they leave the nursery. Um, they come here and spend about two months kind of growing up. So watch the condensation here as we get in the right. winter time. I already got dirty from the hose. So. It's all right. Well, that's clean, recycled, but clean filtered water. So you can see all the, so this is a lot different. The last time it was, when I saw the water, it was a darker brown color. Yeah, I mean, the, the world of clear water farming, and again, look, the water is a clear with a little hint of green, sort of. The world of clear water farming allows us to do a lot of things. and. You know, it's, it's a different looking product when you take them out of the water. Um, they often are a little more blue. These guys are actually on the browner side due to the genetics, but of the eight tanks on the farm, this is the only one that has like a hint of brown. For example, they mostly want to orient into the current. So the current is pushing one way and they're mostly, see how they're mostly facing that way. Um, when they get hungry, they may start to sort of graze the walls more or pick at each other. There's signs, but the clear water allows us to put cameras in the water to observe their behavior. And once we teach a computer to learn what yeah, that behavior looks vision, like, people, yeah, so, yeah, you have thousands of hours of video of shrimp when they're hungry, when they're not hungry, when they're eating. We can use that video to automate feeders that then distribute feed based on video feedback. So you lay out a little more money up front on the capital end, but to maintain your farm and most importantly, to farm shrimp most effectively, not be overfeeding, not be underfeeding, we can, we can now do that. Whereas the industry doesn't really have that opportunity. So we take a look at some if you want. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, these guys are, these guys are almost ready for harvest starting next week. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely one of the first signs of health. They're very, very jumpy. These guys. So there's a few factors on the blue. Um, if you look really close, they're all, they have these blue chromatophores here. So like a squid or an octopus, they have like these blue dots basically. And even the ones that don't look blue, you know, that guy looks brown from a distance. If you look up close, they all have these blue dots. So they're, these are Mexican white leg prawn. They're a close cousin of a Mexican blue prawn. So like I said, with the clear water being kind of a game changer, the environment here allows them to pigment to the black liner and the clear water makes them think I need to be dark colored. The best they can do, you know, they can't turn purple. The best they can do is a dark blue. So on the whole of these eight tanks, um, almost all of them are blue. For whatever reason, the genetics in this tank are strongly brown. And, the, and it's super warm. Like when you kind of put your, just in the air above, it's kind of thick and warm. Is that, or is that kind of like their natural habitat is more warm? This type of prawn lives uh, at a range from as low as 65 degrees up to 92, 93 degrees. Uh, but we find a sweet spot where they grow really well, but not too well that their metabolism is a little extra elevated. So we're growing them around 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. So we heat the water and maintain it at 86. We don't heat the air, but we, we use this greenhouse plastic to trap the moisture. So we reduce our, our water loss um, and also to retain the heat. So in the summertime, we have no heating bill here in Southern California. And in the winter time, we have a heating bill, but we try to keep it reduced as possible by keeping the windows closed. This is all on this side of the building is um, what we call bioflock farming that I talked about, where it's, it's much simpler. The water is kind of a brown color. And this is the reservoir for that system. Um, this side of the building is all dedicated towards the clear water system. So, this is our last production tank here that's full of shrimp growing. Uh, I think as I showed you, each tank has a different age shrimp in it so that we can bring shrimp to market every week of the year. 
now starts the filtration section. So this here is our, for example, our biological filter or physical filters on the other side. And this is a degassing area up here. Okay. So this is where all the pump, this is the whole pumping. There's, there's not a single shrimp in any part of these tanks. Um, this is all dedicated to filtration and making sure we can recapture as much of the water as possible. So it's the brains of the operation. Yeah, this is the brains of it. That's just the, that's the money maker down there is where we grow the animals. But if anything goes wrong over here, you can forget about that. Yeah, you guys can come down here and check out the pumping area. What I tell people is it's basically like we created a wastewater treatment facility for shrimp. You know, compared to most industrial processes and certainly shrimp farming, we're using There's very little 10 to 100 times less water than, than anybody else. So now that we've done the tour, are you guys hungry? No, let's go. Let's go get some shrimp. Prawns. Prawns. Uh -oh. I say shrimp. The industry sh industry says shrimp, but technically they're prawns. Prawns. Yeah, so now that we've harvested our shrimp into a bucket, in this case, it's a small bucket. Usually it's a big old tote with ice slurry. We'll take them into the processing room. So this is where the animal goes from an animal on the farm to a product for consumption. Yeah, so I'm gonna put some gloves on and grab a plate and a knife, some soy sauce, and uh, this will be the raw sushi moment because the industry is used to shrimp that are mistreated. So the average shrimp is three to six months frozen before it gets to you. Um, even on the farms, I mean, these farms are in tropical areas, outdoor, you know, usually former mangroves. Um, so they're miles and miles spread. So you're, you're talking about places too where you know, there's usually not a lot of money. Um, so you're harvesting in 80, 90 degree weather into a truck that might be miles from a farm from the processing area. We're harvesting directly into ice. We're harvesting a product that there's been no reason to add algaecide or pesticide or antibiotics or hormones. There's just no reason for it because we know what's, go what's going on. So it's all about control. Um, so yeah, this product's been dead for, you know, minutes. Um, it's going to be a different texture than it would be in a day or two days. So even that in of itself is kind of cool because it's a unique experience that you can get here that you don't get really anywhere else with, with a similar prawn. Um, California spot prawns are actually a shrimp, but they're, they're a beautiful, you know, natural wild animal that they do eat raw. This is kind of the first in the game where you, you could eat it raw. So this guy's about, I'd say 16 or 17 of these make a pound, about an ounce. The heads I always keep to make a stock or something um, because that's where all the flavor is. So that the head is actually the body and that contains the organs. And that's where the fats are. That's where, um, you know, in, in shrimp farming where you don't know what's gone on, that's where all the bad stuff also accumulates. So most of the industry, you take the head off, preserves the shrimp longer, uh, and hopefully you don't get as many of those fat soluble heavy metals or, or, or toxins. But for us, this is actually like a flavor nugget that you want to use to make a soup or something. Got it. When I'm cooking these, I try to cook them whole because I want that flavor from the head to, to kind of Got seep it. in. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the bar is set pretty low for um, the quality of shrimp. It's customary to cheers, all right. Wow, it's like good. <laughs> it's like good sushi. Yeah. So I'll admit it, I was a little skeptical to try raw shrimp, and I think this is reasonable considering the type of shrimp I'm used to eating. This point was touched upon earlier, but of the 2.2 billion pounds of shrimp imported every year, less than 1% is inspected. Given the questionable practices of producers overseas, there's a probably decent chance that what we've been eating has pesticides or hormones or other banned substances. Not to mention the fact that most of the shrimp we buy in the grocery store has been frozen for three to six months and frozen and thawed multiple times. To put it simply, most of us have never tasted fresh shrimp because we've never had access to it. 
And let me tell you, eating raw shrimp that was harvested a mere minutes ago has profoundly shifted my ideas and expectations about the quality we should expect out of the food we eat. And this is why the word of mouth is spreading, and it's not just everyday consumers like me. We've probably sold to 50 or 60 um, chefs, restaurateurs in, uh, in the Los Angeles area. So a few in San Diego, Orange County, but mostly we've just focused on what we can handle, which is the LA area. Um, and these are places that people in LA for sure have heard of a lot of these places, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the larger groups that we've sold to and sell to fairly regularly or regularly are um, the Jelena Group, uh, based in Venice, uh, Rustic Canyon Group, which is mostly a few restaurants in Santa Monica. Um, and then there's some smaller restaurants that are, you know, on the, the top 101 list or whatever, yeah. um, that are actually really great partners because they're very vocal about what we're doing and they just, they like put us in the limelight of, you know, hey, a key part of what they do, which is amazing, uh, starts with the quality of the ingredients. Um, so we've got some partners like Anna Jack Thai Food and Sherman Oaks. Um, and several, I mean, it'd be hard to start naming them, but yeah. several smaller restaurants. And so they sit down and they want quality. So we deliver quality to the chef and the chef delivers quality to the customer. After that, I think a lot of the stuff that we were driven by, um, the mission related stuff, how much water we reuse, the fact that we don't deal with any mangroves um, is also important, but it's probably a third place. And the second place that I skipped over is, you know, how, how much better this is for you. So the fact that you know, a lot of the shrimp on the market is fine for you. A lot of it isn't. It's all mixed together and we have no way of teasing it apart. You can feel comfortable knowing through videos, you can take tours, and the chefs have pretty much all toured. They can be really confident that there's nothing going into this that could be bad for people. Um, so I think it's number one, quality. Number two, better for human health. And then, you know, number three, and sometimes number two, sometimes for some people it's number one, is the environmental impact that we're reducing and you know, bringing this product to market with less than 1% the carbon footprint of the typical shrimp. I count the days